to the cloud starting now. Does it say it's recording? Yeah, it says it's recording. Good. Well, welcome, everybody. I'm so happy that you're here. This was my friend Christoph's idea. Excellent idea to keep our BT List live webinar series going. Uh, for you, those of you who may not know, the BT List is a Bible translation discussion list made up of Bible translation practitioners working all over the globe. If, if that's you, if you work in Bible translation and you'd be a part of this list, feel free to get in touch with me. I'll just put my email address in the chat and we'll get you added onto the list so you can be dialoguing, interacting with other BT practitioners. Um, so yes, Christoph is a um, translation consultant with SIL International, now based in Switzerland. If you look in the um, is it the guide, a guide to Bible translation that was recent, recently published by the um, United Bible Society? You'll see how many articles do you have in there, Christoph? I know there's one on the Sango Bible in there. I think there's the two little articles, yes. So what did you write about? You wrote the history of the Bi Bible in the Sango language of Central African Republic. And what was the other one that you wrote? Uh, I think the, the article about faux amis, uh, false friends, words. Yes. Uh, okay, false cognates, if you will. Yes. yes. Yeah. No, that's great. Um, well, here we don't have any false friends. Hopefully we can all be real friends with one another, but let's go ahead and jump in. Um, I have a list here of those who wrote in saying they would be happy to read. Um, and if we don't have enough people to read the Hebrew, then we'll just make Christoph read. Um, so verse one here, do we have, let me see my list. Do we have Jay Edwards with us? I don't see Jay. Oh, James Edwards. James is just joining us. Hi, James. Um, would you, James, you signed up to read. Would you be willing to read verse one for us, James, as he walks away and turns off the light? I don't know if James can hear us. All right, we'll come back to James. Um, let's go to Andre. Andre, would you read um, verse one for us? First one, yes, I can try. Andre, oh. Andre, Andrea. Who do you mean? Oh, Andre. Oh, okay. Andre, not Andrea. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, we'll, you'll be um, you'll be next, Andrea. Andrea. Okay, so, so I'll be Andrea. first. Yeah. Okay. First one. Can you read verse one for us? Oh. Sorry. That's okay. Miss Mor, Miss Mor le David, Adonai Roy Lo Ersar. Thank you. All right, Krista. Well, I think you all know that Miss Mor le David is not part of the psalm, but it's a title. And now I don't want to talk about it much. Miss Mor is a technical term and the uh, Beginning of the psalm is, of course, with Adonai Ro'i Lo Echsar. Um, very short, and I want to draw your attention already now to the fact that this psalm has a kind of a circular structure. And the circular structure has the same things in the beginning and in the end. And the rest of the psalm is constructed like something on a hinge. And the most important part is where the hinge meets. So um, Adonai Ro'i corresponds to Veshafti Bevit Adonai. Or you have to, uh, I, I will sit or I will return, we'll see that in the house of the Lord. Uh, as a closure, and this parenthesis, well, <laughs> was the most important word maybe, uh, the Lord um, shows that everything, the, not parenthesis, brackets, I want to say, these brackets hold the whole psalm together. So I don't know how much grammar we do want to look at. Ro'i is one of the participles, typical call active participle, of a verb that can express a profession. And whenever you have a verb that can express a, a, a profession, like the 
which comes from the verb ra'a to shepherd, the participle expresses the profession. You have the same for afa to bake bread, for shofet to um, judge, to be a judge, and many others, all verbs that can express some official um, profession. And here, uh, of course, you can analyze it grammatically as a noun profession or as a um, participle. You have the structure subject plus participle. If you have a structure subject plus participle as a verb, it is usually in, in um, first temple biblical grammar, a sentence that expresses something that's ongoing, that's now, present, pres actual present, or something that is imminent. Here it's not imminent, here it's something that's ongoing. But if you analyze it as a profession, then it's always. So I cannot divide between these two analyses, but I can just tell you that either way, it's a thing that is ongoing, that's always, and um, it's uh, a phrase, a sentence, uh, grammatically as easy as it can be. Interesting detail, the Greek translation does not use the word poimen, the shepherd, but the, the verb, he shepherds me. Uh, you have to go up, yeah, poimainei me. So the Septuagint translators, for whatever reason, have decided to translate roi as a verb, but they often do not like human pictures for the Lord. And they often don't want him to be something. But if it's an activity, um, instead of Lord is my shield, they translate the Lord shields me. That's typical for Septuagint translation. Okay, I don't think there is much more to say about it. Poimai uh, Adonai, Roi, you have an um, participle with a suffix pronoun of the first person. And lo echsar, negation for non deontic sentences. And echsar, a uh, depending on your grammar, imperfect or um, however you call that verb form, yiktol uh, or otherwise, um, uh, inaccompli. It's something that is not in the past, it's always. And here, Drew, you have to dump a little bit about what you know about prose. In poetry, the verb forms can be much more free. Okay, so I think we tell, uh, we agreed, Drew and I, that if you have a question, please add it to the chat and we'll come back to the question at the end. Okay. All right, we're ready to continue with. Um... With uh, verse two, um, Andrea, or Andrea, sorry, Andrea, are you still with us? Would you like to read verse two for us? Okay, I can try. Min ot deshe yarbitseni al me minchot yunachaleni. Yeah. Okay. How much grammar do you want? Or is it for everybody clear? You have. I um Nave, the pasturing ground in plural and construct and deshe the green grass, uh, the pasturing grounds of green grass. Uh, you have, yeah, you have the verb rabats, which is a thing 
we cannot imagine, but everybody who knows camels and cows know that at some point they bend their knees and go down, often to chew the cards. And when you let the animals go down and they, they're sitting there chewing their cuds, and somebody is doing it, it's in Hifil, Yarbitseni, he makes me lay down. And uh, you have Al Me. That's a funny thing for me. I just pointed out in my language and in many languages, if you're on the water, you're surfing or in a boat. But in French and in Hebrew, the tree is al, mine. He's on the water. No, he's not on the river. He's beside the river. But al has a larger meaning than uh, on in English or in other languages. So the, prep, um, the prepositions, like the preposition b, has so many. Um, you have the, the psalm, who is going up to the mountain of the Lord? Mi ya ale bahar. Ba is in, but no, you don't go into a mountain. You don't dig a, a cavern. You go on the mountain, but no, it's ba. Here it's um, the alme menuchot. Menuchot has to do with the root. Uh, nun, chet, both ways with the wav in the middle or the he in the end, which has the meaning of rest. And yet again, you have an imperfect in yena uh, haleni, he guides me towards, but not on the water, it's towards. Okay. Um, can you uh, open the notes, please, uh, Drew? Yes, uh, by notes you mean the the, the, the footnotes of yeah. Okay, is everybody seeing um, verse two here? I think we're. Let me see if I can highlight it for us. You're, we're going, we're going down here in the BHS apparatus, which is not an interesting footnote because nope. it just brings the end of the verse after this um, word. So. Um, this is kind of arbitrary, and you can do it either way. Um, okay. Um, nafshi yeshovev. Should we have somebody read verse three for us, Christoph? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah 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 yeah. All right. Is Emma is Emma on here? Yes, I am. You're up, you're up next. If you could read verse three for us, Emma. Okay. Nafshi Yushovev Yan Yanheni B Bemagala Magale Tzedek Lemaan Shemo. Thank you. Nafshi Nefesh is a very interesting word, and I think you have studied it. It means not only the person which is traditionally is translated by soul, it means first your appetite. And Baal Nefesh, the owner of Nefesh is a glutton. And if the waters come to my Nefesh, it's here, my throat, where my appetite sits. But it has of course a much profounder meaning here, my inner being, myself. Um, nafshi, nefesh, and then the form is a suffix uh, of the first person. Yeshovev is a derived, derivated form of the verb shuv, come back. It's a poel, polel, and uh, polel and uh, meaning he brings back, translated traditionally by restore meaning bring back, like restore, bring back to a good state. Yan Cheni, the Magal Tzedek. Magal 
is a word that has the root of agal in it, which is a um, beef, uh, an oxen. And that's where the oxen draw the carts, which is a, a path. In the path, plural, masculine uh, construct of tzedek. Now, tzedek is a toughie. Tzedek is translation, translated usually by justice. Well, what does it mean, justice? Often in the Psalms and often in the early texts of the Old Testament, tzedek is not something I am right. And not even I'm a righteous in first hand, but it's I'm doing and saying the same thing. If I say a thing like I'm having a contract, a covenant, and I'm breaking it, then it's against Tzedakah. Tzedakah is the one who, even if he offers something he often regrets, he keeps it. So by the path of righteousness, he leads me. And Le Ma'an Shemo is one of the first very important um, uh, it's not because of me. The Ma'an, because Shemo, the name of him. Um, you have seen up until now, it's all imperfect or inaccomplished, inaccompli, and uh, which is not something that I'm telling from the past. It's the thing that is just happening always. Um, yeah. Uh, Ian. Yes, there is, of course, a um, intertextuality from Yanheni to Yenachameni in the next verse. But we'll read it afterwards. Um, yeah. Uh, Yenachameni, the last word, uh, which has one letter additioned. Uh, those um, assonances uh, are sometimes just for pleasure of good poetry. They may be not too deep, but in good poetry, you like sounds. Yeah. So up until now, we are still in a uh, pastoralist's world, the shepherd who has sheep and brings them to green grass and water and um, makes them that their life Nefesh here is almost synonym to life. My life he brings back to good shape because I'm fed and I'm watered. And he leads me. Because of his name, everybody who does Old Testament theology knows that the name of a person and the person are almost the same because of him, of how he is, of how who, who he is. So we come to verse four. Yeah, can we ask uh, ask uh, Andy Huber to read for us, Andy? Yes. Verse four. Gam kielech beget salmavet lo yira ra ki ata imadi shiftecha u mish sorry u mishantecha. Hema Yenachamuni. Thank you. Um, Gamki Elech. Here you have within poetry a typical function of the imperfect, which is a possibility. Imperfect often has a modal uh, meaning. It's from the verb halach, the imperfect of kal. And even if I would had may go, but ge salmavet, 
guy, the valet, gay, the construct of it. Salmavit is maybe a um, Masoretic uh, um, punctuation. Maybe it was Salmut. Salem is shadow, and Salmut is the shadow Nessi or something, shadowiness. But if you make the punctuation by Tsal Mavet, it sounds like Tsel, the shadow, and Mut, Mavet, the death. And many translations go by shadow of death. But in itself, the word probably means just the darkest shadow you can think of. Even if I have to go in the valley of the darkest shadow, lo ira ra. I will, I may not fear bad ra in the abstract things of bad in, bad things. Ki ata imadi. Those are the middle words of the psalm. And ki ata imadi is the hinge on which the two parts of the psalm hold together. You are with me. No verb there. That's always. If you have a nonverbal clause, it's just something that is intemporal. It's always you are with me. And im is the stronger with than it. There is another word, it. I'm with people in the bus, that's it. But the Lord is with me, that's him, which is stronger. And then you have still two uh, props of uh, pastoralists, Shevet and Mishenet, uh, two different um, utensils the shepherd use. Your and in English, you have different words. In French, you have different words. But they're basically two type of sticks, your stick and your staff. Hemma ye nachamuni. Now, the root nacham, nicham, is um, a root that means to comfort, give consolation. And it is strange that a rod and the staff comfort. Hmm. Rod and the staff may protect, may even aggress, may hit. Here's comfort. And there, lo and behold, you have a note. And the note says, PRP, ye, uh, Jan Huni, which is from the same. Uh, family as Jan Cheni in verse two, three, meaning they will um, guide me. That's so much easier. But I will draw your ears. PRP, forget it. If you don't have a ancient translation, tradition, that goes that way. Most often it's modern thinking and says, that's not normal. The word that go together is staff and rod and lead. Of course, it's logical. Well, we are people of the 21st century and those Psalms are from another world. So we, I think we are better um, counseled if we stick with what is the big tradition. Can you bring the Greek? Uh, please, Drew. Whoops. Yeah, let me let me clear all this annotation. Yet, yeah, so Greek. So where are we here? That's uh, verse four. Ufovathas my kaka otisu met emu a. I don't fear bad. You see, it's word by word. It's it's really literal translation because you uh, with me are. Greek needs the verb. Harabdos su kai habakteria su autai me parakalesam. Parakaleo, parakletes, that's comfort. So the Septuagint 
did not have even the slightest idea to straighten the picture and say, no, that's not logical. They had the same tradition and therefore it is not often when it has PRP in the notes. It's nice, but not really a good idea. So let's go back to the Hebrew. Yeah, thank you. Um, but uh, the last thing with Shiftecha and Mishantecha, Hema Yenachamuni, the picture changes to a different world. We are now, it's still wor words from the agriculturalist uh, pastoral world, but with verse five, it's finished with that world and it comes a festival, feast, big uh, meal in a hostile context. There oh, are, uh, with the, the next two verses, and it's not a sheep anymore, uh, it, it's a person. Verses one to three, the me, the, the, the speaker, is a sheep. Now it seems to be a human. And that makes sense that a staff and the rod comfort because I know the big, he has his arms. And that's again where the, where the, um, it shows that the middle wor words, lo irara ti ata imadi, I do not fear bad because you are with me. Those words hold the two parts together. Okay, somebody wants to read verse five. Yeah, can we ask uh, James? James Edwards, would you be willing to read verse five for us? Right, thank you. Ta'arok lifanau shulkan Neder Tsorau Dashanta the Shemen Rosha Roshi Kosi Rava Ya. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you, you James. Yeah. Yeah, I um, just in the reading, in the reading, Christoph, um, well done, um, James. But um, the we have a Dalit here, don't we? Yes. Um, I, I can read it back if you wish. No, okay. no, no, it's fine. It's fine. I just think it's interesting. You often see scribal variation between Dalit and Rish, right? And, yeah. yeah. And no, it's fine. Yeah, let's go. If ever you have the chance to look at the facsimile edition of the Leningrad Codex, which is a beautiful, big, expensive book. I had it at the seminary in Africa where I was. I looked at it. You look at those Reshs and Dalits and you say, my, oh my, how can they uh, read them and, and make the differentiation? Anyway. Anyway. Ta'aroch, yeah. uh, Shulchan and Ta'aroch go together. Uh, there is a Hebrew, a Jewish tradition, Shulchan Aruch. Shulchan is the word for table. And the, ver the verb Arach means to spread table, which is to set out the table with all the nice food on it. And Shulchan Aruch is the uh, spread out table. It's a Jewish um, treatise. But here you have a real table that is spread out. You spread out a table, Shulchan, Lefanai in front of me. Now this is a festival, uh, not a festival, how do you say, a, a ceremony, a, a big a meal. A banquet? A banquet, yeah, right, that's the good word. Neget Sorarai. Sorar is the person who is hostile to me, and Neget is in face of. So this is really strange. And that's why, of course, you have a proposition in verse five. Because Shulchan ends with a nun. And the next word starts with a nun. 
And Hebrew texts in the beginning were not written in separate words. So sometimes you could not make mistakes in separating words or write a letter double. And so some people propose, PRP comes from propose, that you take one noon away, the last noon of Shulchan, and take a different vocalization and you read Shelach, which is an arm. You prepare arms in front of me in face. Uh, yeah, missile shoot comes from the verb shalach. But I would say it to translate, I would say arms. You prepare arms in front of me against my enemies. Oh, lovely. I get somebody who is, um, is uh, defending me. Oh, wait a minute. What do the Septuagint people say? Um, okay, where are we here? My Septuagint. Trapeza is a table, nothing of weapons. So the Septuagint did not see a um, arm or a missile, whatever. So again, it's, it's a proposal that makes some logic to people. Of course, uh, there are enemies. And if you have enemies, you have to defend yourself. Uh, go ahead, you prepare my defense. No, I don't think so. Because what comes afterwards, if we look at the context, dishanta vashemen roshi. Now, you remember that fellow that invited Jesus for a festival and then comes the sinners and, uh, and then uh, Jesus says, you invited me and you did not give me any perfume on my head. Well, for a good festival, you don't own, some of you have lived in Africa and if you go to a festival, to a banquet in Africa, the women buy those deodorants and spray you with it all over. Uh, that, belongs just to a banquet. So if you have the Shanta Vashem and Roshi, you um, fatten my, with a, you, you smear with perfume my head, that doesn't go with arms. I'm sorry, that goes with a table that's placed with full of nice and fat food. And the third one, Kosi Revaya, Kos is the um, goblet. My goblet, revaya is, it's almost, it's drunk. There is a verb that's close to it that means it's drunk. That's really full. Mm -hmm. uh, traditionally, in some translations, it overflows, which is a bit messy for me because I'm modern European. But um, if the cup is full, that is, I can drink as much as I want. It doesn't say what is in the cup, but anyway, for the Baptists among <laughs> us. Now, the Septuagint, they cut the verse differently and read on with ach tov, with verse five. And so the Septuagint says, kaitopotarion mu mesuskon hoskratiston. My uh, cup, is drunk like with the best. And kratiston is the superlative of, of good. And that is the translation of the Septuagint for tov in the next verse. So sometimes the Septuagint, they did not have the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia under their eyes, unfortunately. So they cut the verses differently. Mm -hmm. And that happens. Anyway. Okay, um, let's go back to the Hebrew, please. Now, I was telling in the beginning, I don't want to make too long so that we can have some time for questions. Um, you have a full picture of plenty. Ta'aroch, a full table with the best food and uh, even perfumes given to the uh, invited people and a full cup of whatnot. 
What does the sheep have? Verse three, verse two. The best green grass fields and silent good still waters. Well, sheep don't want much more than that for a best festival. I'm a human being. Um, I like to have uh, once in a while a good Sunday meal. But it corresponds verses two and verses five for the content in the two different pictures. Hmm. And it nafshi uh, yeshovev il he uh, brings back my life. Um, that is in that verse as well, because it goes with, he comforts me, verse four at the end. Now, oh, comfort. let's, oh, what? There we go. He, uh, the, the, the staff and the, the rod comfort me. Those two are both uh, into restoration. Hmm. And then uh, you have uh, the last verse that we still would like to read. And there we have the only interesting textual problem. Let's have verse six. Um, do we have, uh, um, let's see, is Halvor with us? Can we ask Halvor to read uh, the final verse? Or not? Um, how about Meg? Is Meg, Meg on here? Are you willing to read for us, Meg? Sure, I'd be happy to. Verse six. Achto v'chesed yirdefuni kol yeme chayai v'shavti bevet Adonai v'orech yamim. Thank you. Thank you. Tov uh, v'chesed are uh, closely related by the uh, vocalization of the vav. If you have a vav with va and two terms that are um, semantically close, they're really stuck together. You have it with uh, yom valayla, day and night. You have it tov vara, and you have it with um, uh, shamayim va'aretz and other things. And here you have good and chesed. Chesed is often translated by grace. But chesed is something different to begin with. Chesed is uh, the faithfulness or the faithful love of a covenant partner to begin with. So is this your chesed? Is this the way you keep your covenant? Later it became, in later Hebrew, it became, it got the meaning of, um, uh, of uh, being uh, graceful, Merciful. nice to poor. Um, yeah, it, 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 it got a different meaning. And so the Septuagint translators translate chesed differently. But in early first temple period, chesed was the covenant partners, what was expected of a covenant partner. It's translated by love, but love, of course, has many different meanings. It's not the love of uh, man and woman. It's not the love of parent and children. It's not the love you have towards your Hebrew Bible, but it's the love you have you towards your covenant partner, whoever that is. Yeah, Elios. That's not the meaning. Elios is the translation of chesed for the Septuagint translators. And it's the meaning it had in Hebrew at the time of the Septuagint translators, like third or second century before Christ. But in the time of David and up to Hezekiah, the, the exile, it had a different meaning. Okay, so, um, yeah, loyalty, but it's loyalty in a positive meaning. It's not, I have to be loyal, but it's, I like this guy and because he is faithful, I'm faithful and we have a good relationship. It has a lot to do with good relationship. Yeah, but you see, faithful, it's, a, it's, a, you see it's, it's a covenant relationship. You okay. see faithful love here in some English translations. All right. Yes, yep. which is a good translation, I think. Um, ah is uh, 
one of those little words that have a very fluffy meaning, um, only or truly, or there, there are many meanings. Uh, there is also a textual variant. Um, uh, On to? No, that, 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 that says that, ach, no, no. It says that Achtov, the two of them go in the Septuagint with verse five. As I said, it, uh, mm -hmm. my cup is filled and is drunk with only good things. Ah, yes. Yeah, right. So um, the funny verb is Yirdefuni. Radaf means to, um, how do you say pursuivre in English? Um, uh, run after? Chase. Yeah, but it, most often it's hostile. And it, there, is a there are a few um, places where it's not hostile, but most often it's in war and they run after the enemies till they kill them all and chase. Yeah, right. Thank you, Adam. <laughs> uh, here, of course, it has no negative meaning because of tov vachesed, they have a good meaning and it's again context that gives to this a little bit strange. Uh, you cannot say um, goodness and faithful love chase me. No, <laughs> they follow on my heels, but in a good way, of course. Yirdefuni, you have yirdof, which would be the yirdefu. And you're the funi then uh, with the pronoun suffix. Kol yeme chayai, all the days of my life. By the way, kol is a noun, not an adjective. It's construct, the totality of the days of the life of me. Hmm. But uh, that doesn't matter. Shafti is the only textual interesting pro um, uh, problem. Because the shafti can be either a um, perfect consecutive of the verb shuv, and I will return, which is as a perfect a consecutive will uh, is a, a future. Mm. But if you change the vowel a into patach, into a chirek, and you have e, the shifti, then you have the verb um, yashav, to sit, to be, to dwell, in the infinitive, shevet, hinematovu menayim, shevet achim gan yachat, the sitting of friends, that's the same infinitive, shifti, my sitting. And my sitting in the house of the Lord for length of days. Both can make sense. And it's difficult to say which one is um, uh, the, the real original one. It's only a vowels difference. And vowels were noted only much later. So the Septuagint had no vowels in their most likely had no vowel points in their uh, Vorlage. And uh, so the Septuagint gives us, um, what do they give? Can we have the Septuagint? Katoi came to dwell, my dwelling. So obviously, Kaito Katoi came en oikokuriu eis makru teta hameron. Literally, but they understood shifti as an infinitive of yashav, to live, to dwell. But they had no vowels. So shifti, I will return to the house of the Lord, is also possible. Now, I will not decide that question. I will only say, among all the textual problems of this verse, this is the only real problem. And I think one can be, for different reasons, of either uh, opinion, because who is in the house of the Lord? It's the priest. It's the, um, yeah, the priest. But 
the one person who writes, is it David? Is it somebody else? It's maybe no priest. So where can he go? He go he can go into the chatzer, into the court of the temple, but not into the temple. At least not in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, that's a different thing. Now, I have talked a lot. Questions. Yeah, we invite you, if you have a question, um, just unmute yourself in an orderly fashion and um, ask your question. A question? If there is a question or something you want to add, Halbert, you are a specialist more than I. Oh, no, I just wanted to look at those two verbs that get translated in some translations. They both get translated led. And the one is yanahaleni and the other one is yancheni. If right. there's a different nuance between the two. Oh, sure, sure. Difference is always difference. So if you have a difference in words, there is a nuance. That's that's in I think most almost any language. But still, they go into the same um, bigger semantic field of leading. But I cannot tell you much about this. I'm sorry. That is a point of disc dictionaries and articles. They write certainly a lot about it. And you may know something, Oliver. Let us know if you know something. Well, it's two different kinds of leading. Uh, the one is more just uh, leading the flock uh, as you're walking along slowly, whereas the other one, Yancheni, is much more directive. And we have uh, African Bible translators who come through our program and they have different words for two different kinds of leading. Uh, yes. So the yancheni is more with the shepherd either out in front or behind, you know, directing the flocks to move toward where the water is, or the other is just kind of being there, protective, uh, wandering along slowly. So uh, our joy, uh, in uh, playing with semantic domains uh, is to bring out the nuances uh, as being uh, contributing to greater uh, impact and vividness, liveliness of the text. Thank you, Halver. I think this is very important and especially if you make a translation for a agriculturalist uh, people group. Uh, who or, or pastoralist people group, for them that's very important and they have also the vocabulary to express it. For others like me, urban, modern European, it would rather maybe merit a good footnote. But uh, it depends on, on the um, different uh, um, life experiences you have. Uh, we see in the translation of Old Testament all over the place, if we have um, pastoralist societies, they have much more access to some of the Old Testament texts than uh, other societies. That's very important. Thank you, Halbert. That's a very good, um, helpful um, specification. Yes, you're, uttering, you're uttering exactly what we found, that uh, some of the people live in uh, social conditions closer to those of those days and uh, have insights that they can share with us of European background. Right, thank you. Another uh, comment would be about Yirdifuni. Um, our little daughter was maybe five years old and in the little children's Bible class, they were asked to draw a picture of that uh, Bible verse. So she drew a little girl being chased by two small lambs. And one of them was Tov, Tov and the other was Hesed. And so <laughs> I actually enjoy the fact 
it doesn't mean follow along after me. It means they chase me. The Lord is so concerned <clears throat> with uh, doing good for me that it's actually like Lirdov. It pursues after me. It doesn't just trip along behind me. <laughs> it, it, it struck me when I was a young student and one of my fellows made a, a sermon about it and he got the bad grade because the professor of um, hermeneutics would not like his remarks. But I said, Yirdefuni is chase. Oh, but you can also chase somebody with good intentions. That's and it. so I know that the Lord is after me with good intentions. And I think that's oh, important man. to oh, follow man. with this. Beautiful. So thank you, Oliver. Maybe somebody else has also a, a little question. We need to close, I think, by the hour. Yes, that's right. Yeah, we can. Uh, yeah, we've got to wrap this up. Um, I got to get back to my consultant checking. So yes, we've got about eight more <laughs> minutes, but we can close sooner if, um, if there are no more questions. But yes, if there are any more questions or comments. Also, if you would wish something slightly different, we have, this is kind of a trial balloon. And um, if it's too quick, too many verses, or if it's too little grammar or too much grammar or whatever, let us know. Um, I started reading the Bible a lot many years ago and I still le read the Bible often in and much in Hebrew and in Greek and I started also to read it out loud and it helped me a lot but it's not funny to do it by myself alone so uh, if we can have reading together that's um, people can also have more um, impact maybe the group is too big I don't know maybe it's not we just don't know so any feedback would be very welcome if you want to Go on with it. We propose in about a month, a next session with a different text. And um, yeah, we have to find an hour <laughs> all around the globe. It's a little bit early for some and a little bit late for others. Can't be helped. Uh, so um, give us a feedback. And uh, if you are interested, we'll send out a next invitation and um, uh, and go on if that's fine um, but it's just time for one little more question maybe uh, i want to just comment very briefly that i'll be forever grateful for discovering for all the study that my wife and i have done of this psalm that ki ata imadi is exactly in the middle i'll be forever grateful for that thank you <laughs> right mm. okay I appreciate hearing specific examples about translating into local languages as in, yeah, could be done. Um, yeah. Any other last question? Okay. Um, maybe Drew. Why don't you close 